welcome back. We are going to continue with our process of forging a pair of tongs, but really what I'd like to do is make it real clear to anybody that's watching that's interested in this is that I'm not showing how to forge a pair of tongs particularly. What I'm showing is technique, what I'm showing is process, and I'd like for everybody to be trained as a blacksmith, not just shown how to make a pair of tongs. So it's similar to difference between a, maybe a cook and a chef and a chef is gonna uh, know how to cook but know the chemistry behind the cooking process and uh, the combination of the different ingredients and they'll be able to write the recipes. A cook is gonna follow those recipes and uh, so what I want to do is I want to make it real clear that I'm interested in training blacksmiths. I'm not particularly showing you how to forge a pair of tongs. There's a lot of videos out there that uh, is going to show you that. What I want to do is I'm going to show you the nuances, um, the kind of the secrets that maybe people aren't elaborating very much on when they're forging. So they're maybe not thinking about it. When they're thinking about it, they're not saying it. Or when they're forged, done forging it, they, uh, they forgot. And so they're not going to give you all these details. So what I'm going to try to do is, is uh, vocalize, verbalize what's going on in my mind when I'm forging. And so if you've watched the videos beforehand, you'll see that as I'm forging, I'm talking, and, uh, and what I'm doing is I'm letting you know what's going on uh, as I'm doing this. So uh, there's a lot of things that, I, that I'm known for, my hammers, my taunts, uh, my designs, and, and, and those I will like elaborate on further in, in, in different videos. And in those videos, you'll also see these nuanced techniques that uh, you may not see in other uh, videos. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that I explain that. And when I started blacksmithing, I picked up a book and I decided this is this is for me and I want to do this. And I went into my metal shop. Uh, it was a shared metal shop. I didn't have hardly any equipment. And uh, I started reading the book and, and, I, and I didn't know the vocabulary. I didn't have any of the tools. And so I started making some of these tools as well as I could, but I just didn't have somebody that shared with me these details. And it was a long process of learning on my own and being kind of shy, going to demonstrations and meeting people here and there and not answer, asking a lot of questions. And little by little, I started putting it together, but it really wasn't until I studied with some masters that it, 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 it all gelled. And uh, I think that if you have not studied with the master, this is an opportunity. And I'll tell you everything that I've learned from masters. Uh, in fact, what I want to do with this series is bring you through everything that I can that was in my classes. I taught hand forging. I taught power hammer forging. I taught tool making. I taught, I taught design. I taught uh, furniture making. I taught uh, conceptual forging and then an advanced blacksmith class. So what we're doing today is kind of an in, in introduction to what you're going to expect uh, in future videos relative to the hand forging process and the power hammer process. This is just a little taste, but I thought that you should see um, this process combined to begin with. And then later on, we'll start forging things like handles and nails and hooks, uh, brackets, uh, We'll get into forging uh, bending wrenches, twisting wrenches, hammers, uh, hardy tools. There's just the whole gamut. And I want you to understand how to select the material, proper forging technique, proper holding technique, heating technique, and hitting technique. Then it's really going to be up to you. It unlocks a lot of possibilities in the shop for making tools for yourself, making tools for other uh, tradesmen. I've made tools for mechanics. I've made tools for woodworkers but then making tools for yourself so that you can explore different shapes and you can find your voice in ironwork and sculptural ironwork. So today we're going to continue with our tongs and I am making a mountain out of molehill. I am forging the longest hour uh, to take, hour long time to take to forge a pair of tongs but the reason why is because it's a stepping stone user platforms that I can elaborate to forging techniques. So today we're going to pick up where we left off and I put things on the floor that are, I think that are, that were hot, that are hot and you can tap them. I've been also told to use the back of your hand. I prefer to burn the inside of my hand versus 
the outside. So it's going to be up to you. But these have been on the on the floor for a long time. I find I still tap things just uh, out of good habit. So this is where we left off last time. Uh, and this is the process that we're going through. So down here, you can see that we started off with a number six rebar. Each number on um, rebar represents one eighth of an inch. And this is forged a long time ago too. And you can also see here that these numbers represent um, the mill, the, the, uh, the type of steel, and then the pounds per square inch, the minimum yield strength. So that's 60 right there. So this is 60,000 minimum yield strength. And through my research, not through the Rebar Association, but through my research, uh, American Metal Association, uh, the Handbook of Forging, there's, you can cross-reference and you'll find that rebar is very similar composition to 4140. So that's why I've selected rebar for most of my tongs now. I used to use leaf spring or uh, coil spring, 4160 or 5160, but uh, I don't have uh, access to scrap material. I don't have access to junkyard material anymore, but there's so much rebar and it's very inexpensive to buy now. I re uh, repeat myself, but uh, so the first process was forging this out into a square taper. Then, and, and this is extra material, but we started off with 10 inches of stock, 10 by 10, that's 20. So this started off 20 inches long. We forged seven to 10 on the square. We, we started breaking the corners to hammer polish. And then, then we, we hammer polished into the octagon. And remember when I hammer polished in the octagon, I forged it on the diamond a little bit wider facet than I, and then I, when I go back to the flat, then I make sure the facets are the same. If the facets are the same, then you have a true octagon. So square, octagonal. And octagon is very similar in volume to a circle. So uh, if you wanted to uh, calculate this, the volume of a cone, then you have a very similar uh, calculation than you would as the volume of, a, uh, of an octagon, just for future reference. Then we, we uh, marked on the anvil two inches and we forged our very first offset, the offset for the bit. So this is our bit. And that offset is a nice radius to edge here. And you can see I forged this down to 3 8 I'm using this tongue as a corner, but this is 3 quarter, forged this down half the dimension. I forged it on the rib because that rib gives me a point of reference. So it's important to have a point of reference, a line of reference, or plane of reference. So you can go back to dimensions, make uh, measurements and that kind of thing. So, so on the rib, I forged this vertically half to the mention. So that gives me three eighths by three quarters. And oftentimes I can tell if I've gone to how, how thin it is by how wide it is up here. We'll talk more about that when you get into tapers. But I'm watching this go to three quarter. This three quarter is about the same as that. And then I'll know that this is at three eighths. So what's going on underneath is uh, giving you a visual of what's happening at the top. Remember that bulb too, that bulb I leave. So if I, if I need to, I can forge this to finish because this is pretty stiff material. If I try to forge this all in one heat, it's gonna get thinner. And then when I take another heat, this is gonna get overheated. So it's a really good practice to uh, try to heat where you intend to shape and to finish that shaping in that heat. And if, so this is the, the technique of forging inside out. So we're forging here and we're gonna forge here and then we we'll forge there. So then we want, then this is a pair of tongs I forged a while back, but it, it, uh, it illustrates that next step, which would be uh, forging the, the two other offsets. So that's, that's our first offset. Our second offset is at 45 degrees of the anvil. So I forged this the three inches after I forged that bulb out, slight taper in both directions, this direction and that direction. So um, I, I forged my bit at a 45 on the, on the anvil and I made sure that that spread to about an, an inch. Then I broke the corners of that. As y'all remember how it's done here, or it's done here, you hammer just like square octagonal around, but being that that's rectangular before I broke the corners, then I have to really tilt that up to be able to hit the diagonal through the perpendicular. So once I have that forged out, this is what I'll be working on next. Um, this, this doesn't get hammered yet, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna forge the reins so that they are tapered wide here to narrow. And then if you look at it from this, this direction, it's narrow to wide. And uh, 
I, I think that the wide rain down here gives you, it just feels nice in the hand. It's not something that it's hard edge like a round taper. And you get the strength of the material on edge here. So that's quite a bit of strength. That's not as much strength. Uh, that's not as much weight. That's got a lot of bearing on your hand. So this is just kind of to take uh, inventory of where we are. And so we're in between these two steps right now. So we're back and I'm going to get my forge going again. I don't have enough heat for the spontaneous uh, so I'm gonna gas forge you still have to tame your forge so I push the bricks in the back so that I don't lose any heat and I've got them uh, bricked up in the front and also that small gap closed so that it'll heat, it'll heat up uh, rather quickly so the next thing I want to do is I'm going to take our tong and uh, make sure that I'm going to forge the rain out so that the rains are this cross section, that thin to thick, and that thick to thin. So the forge itself is nine inches long. It's the it's the length of a fire brick, not by accident, uh, because of the idea I can stack bricks on the back side. So what I'm going to do is uh, this is longer than nine inches. This is uh, eleven or so, eleven and a half. Uh, so what I need to do is I need to heat it here and then heat it here and heat it there, heat it there. So I, I need to shift it back and forth. now it's gonna like clean up all of this right here so it's gonna knock that uh, shoulder down to meet that dimension and then it's gonna forge these two tapers so I, I, I sequence how I load the steel and if I put both of the pieces in the fire at the same time then they're both gonna be hot at the same time so I'll put one in to begin with and then I'm talking about this one and I'll put this one in in a, in a second or so now, you can see that the monkey hands, they had, they, uh, since it has that split, that groove, and that cut, then it accommodates this even though that is a rectangular taper. So the monkey hands themselves are good tongs to forge a pair of monkey hands. And I never rely on myself squeezing the reins at all times. Uh, what I want to do is always use a tong clip. And uh, a tong clip, if you, if you can't get it on back here, then what you can do is you can put it on here. Now, I'll always kick the reins out just a little bit there at the very end. So as this tongue clip slides down, it can't fall off because then it has to go even further in order to pop that tongue clip off. So, so now that tongue is balanced. And you can see that it allows me to hold it here. And that, that is the pretty much the balance point. I don't wanna get too close to it, but it's a lot less work when you're forging if the tongs provide the other end of your balance for whatever you're, you're forging. So now's the time to put this in the fire. And I'll really leave the tongs on in the fire. Now, when I was explaining the other day about lower your expectations, I didn't mean I don't have a high degree of like quality consciousness, but what I'm saying is that you've got, you know that these are rebar, and you know if they get hot, then they'll spring. When you have a tongs that are sprung, it means they bent and they're created by the fire, you can destroy them by the fire. So don't expect to be able to heat your tongs. And mainly the whole idea of like lower your expectation, don't expect to be able to quench these. These were made out of mild steel, you can quench them, not a problem. But they're not going to give you the spring that the leaf spring or the coil will give you. So don't uh, push them to your standards. Understand the standards of the material. This goes whether you're forging the tongs out of 4140, 8620, uh, 5160, anything other than mild steel, you're really going to want to make sure that you don't quench your tongs unless you want to crack them. So uh, 
when I say lower expectations, just don't impose your expectations on the material, which it already has the degree of like carefully classified alloying elements into the iron. And uh, this has been pre-engineered, so we can push the engineering of the rebar to make tongs, but don't go too far with it. I would suggest making chisels out of it uh, and heat treating it. I just think that it makes a good springy uh, uh, base material for this kind of thing also uh, for battery tools. That, so, so again, the torch, not, not long enough. I could make a long torch, but then I'd be heating most of the time three inches of the torch that I won't use. So I don't mind what I call babysitting. So I'm gonna heat this. This needs to be heated. This is heavy takes longer to heat, then I'm going to pull this and I'm going to heat this. So I'm going to pull it in and out. Whenever you have to uh, surveil, just pay attention to what's going on inside the forge. I call that babysitting. So whether it's like bringing it up on the rising heat, which is what I'm doing now, dropping it on the falling heat from the forging temperature down to the lower transformation temperature, or tempering kind of thing, you want to babysit the material. You don't want to put the stock in the fire and just walk away because that's going to uh, not give you the complete control that you need when you're working. So, right. so now I've got my heat further here. It's still about 1400 degrees here. I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to move it back and forth. Now this is starting off with the forge relatively cool. So when that forge is hot, it won't take very long to move the stock in and out of that back slot so that I can have a consistent heat. So now I'm going to come up here. So just pay attention so you can see where my burner is. It's right there. Okay, that's really the only thing that's hot in the forge. What happens is the burner creates the flame which is hot. Then, you, then the flame propagates and it heats the refractory. Then, when the refractory is hot, that's what gives you the heat. Not so much the burner. The burner keeps it at the temperature, but you get your heat from the refractory. So right now, I'm only getting heat from the burner because the refractory isn't hot. But when, when the forge is even heat, then it would be much easier to babysit this and then come up with a consistent heat throughout. So I don't want to try to light it up with a hammer blow that's showy. Uh, I don't, uh, it also could possibly crack it. So I'm going to wait until I get my heat. So I'm pretty close on this. So I'm going to set this, hold this on the diamond. This is what I mean. You can get your tongs hot. So I'm, so I'm going to, I'll, I'll put my tongs in. Hard the first time it went wide. 
then I pull it hard the second time. I hit it hard here, and then lighter and lighter. That went wide. So it was. I was able to achieve this double paper, wide to narrow, narrow to wide, just by how I hit it. And I'll show this to you again. all the way through. You can see that's my octagon. Octagon has that radius edge so that edge doesn't bite onto you when you use the song. You can straighten it as it needs. It's a good heat to straighten it. So baby sisters, I need to heat that tip. I don't want to try to light it up as a power knife. is now a lot hotter, so it's a lot more consistent. to my side. I don't walk around like this. It's very dangerous. So I'm going to start with the jaw down. Get it hard all the way through. I'm watching how it widens here because if this is wide, then that's paper. Now I'm going to go back. Using this as my dimension, I'm going to hammer this. So this dimension, 3-8, I'm going to hammer this down. broken uh, octagon, which is a nice uh, feel to the hands. I've got my wide to my narrow, my narrow to my wide. And take it over the handle. Now this, we're talking about a very refined grain size with this because I started out about 2,000 degrees and my finished forging is uh, about 1,200 degrees. Got any twists? Now's the time to take the twists out. I'll show on further videos how to make this twisting wrench. Make sure at this point in time it's got a little bit of a twist. Okay, so that twist is out. Okay. the ram clean. It, my shop is somewhat still open. The windows kind of stay open. I've got openings on both sides. And if I don't keep the ram up, then it doesn't stay lubricated and it, it's going to rust. The other thing is, when you start, when you turn your hammer on initially, if the ram is all the way down, a little thing there. Interesting. I didn't put that there. But, uh, when the ram is all the way down, then when you turn the hammer on, then that motor has to work exceptionally hard to bring the ram up on the initial start. So uh, to keep uh, your cap capacitors on your five horsepower single phase motor healthy, it's gonna be happier if you block it up because there's gonna be no load on the, on the, the motor. The, the full load amps on this is about 23 amps. 220 uh, single phase, but you're pulling all of those amps right at startup. There's no reason to do that. So there's two reasons, like I said, to, to block it up. Another thing too is just it's not as noisy. So if I let the ram drop, then every time I turn it on, it's gonna, it's gonna hit. So uh, anyway, uh, that's that's why I block the ram up. Okay. So the next step. Is to, now, you have to ask yourself, is it or isn't it cool enough to quench? And 
if sometimes what I'll do is I'll I'll cheat and I'll dribble it just a little bit and I'll, I'll I'll take the temperature down before if if this immediately rolling off then that's that's harder than 250 degrees so um, that's that's cooler now and. What I'll do is I'll plunge it occasionally in the water if I feel confident. If it's if it's steaming, then I'm getting pretty close to being able to, if it just evaporates off instead of rolling like that, then I'll be able to, just right here, you can see that it's it's evaporating off. So that what I'll do is I'll plunge it. So I don't want to like cool it completely. I'll let that water evaporate off. And this will be able to take it down so I can hold on to it, okay? But don't, don't just plunge that because you could heat treat it inadvertently. But if you can work without tongs, then uh, you have more control because tongs are always going to give you a potential for a pivot. They're uh, going to be maybe slightly askew. So if you can hold on to the ends of your work versus using tongs, then do that. But uh, sometimes it's unavoidable, and that's why you want to use tongs. Uh, using this technique, make a lot of different styles of tongs and uh, uh, I can make a smaller idea of this pickup tong and this these aren't uh, split out but they do have a, a super groove and they also have the little forward end so that you can make sure that when you pick something up that you have three points of contact at least if you got four great but if you only have two then you've got to pivot so these are very small pickup tongs, uh, very handy tongs. Um, you can see that either, these are either made out of coil spring, leaf spring, or rebar, and they're going to have all of this, the same uh, performance. These are made out of rebar. Um, I can't really see any reinforcing rib left, but I know they were made out of rebar. And when you make tongs, you can start thinking about how to make your own design. And so these are flat jaw tongs with the middle removed. So these will hold uh, material uh, vertically. It will hold stock as long as you can see that that does pivot because it's only holding on two points of contact. So I'd have to hold them on the on edge in order to be at the control. But not all tongs are going to have that ideal, but these these would be made for holding half inch stock, and that half inch stock would uh, not spin. They're also scrolling pliers, so when I if I want to, I can use them for bending. And we'll get into that later, as far as how uh, and, and the jury would be out whether uh, you want to have too many features of your tongs. But this these are actually pretty handy tongs. Some. Uh, Paws tongs forged the same way. Another set of paws tongs that are uh, wolf jaw. The wolf jaw is notched so I can hold stock this way as well as this way. Very similar approach. These you can you can definitely tell they're made out of rebar. Here's the reinforcing uh, texture on a, on a piece of rebar, and uh, these have the fuller groove and also some cross hatching for texture. Basically the same technique for scrolling pliers. I made these in 2002. Uh, didn't forge this shoulder down, but I do now. Um, but uh, these scrolling pliers work best when they are parallel. So if I have scrolling stock that uh, is anywhere between a quarter and half of an inch, then um, then these would work very well. They also like, get into pulling things, uh, bolt jaw uh, or bolt and uh, scrolls, that kind of thing. And then using kind of the same technique, except that reversing my pivot, 
I can use these for spreading tongs. And so these, these come in handy quite a bit when you're adjusting scroll work, you're adjusting shapes. These are actually, uh, these tongs are actually tongs that I designed based on that idea of three points of contact. So there's, there's a forged point and the jaw is split. And these are designed to hold logs. So I, I find that fireplace tongs are not well designed. So if you have, if you have something that will have three points of contact, then, then you can move that around and they won't spin in the jaws. Because you can see the three points of contact right there. came up with this concept about 30 years ago and it's called a treble torch. So it's the idea of taking a hand torch and this one I put a propane tip on. But you can put a propane tip on a oxyacetylene torch and convert it to propane. And I've got what's called a gas saver in here. And this is a gas saver. And the gas saver, what it does is that I'll strike the pilot and then I'll have a flame coming up. This just protects my gas saver. I'll have a flame coming up and then when the gas saver, it's a valve that turns your fuel and your oxygen on when this lever is depressed. So I came up with a concept of like depressing that lever. And if you, you can see it on the other side, how the linkage will depress that lever. So, so come around here and I'll show you when I step on this, it's going to so the lever is down now, and then all of this causes that lever to rise. So that allows the fuel to pass. Now, when I initially designed this, um, I designed it so that I would be working only on one side, but then I realized that I would kind of like to be able to work on this side too. So this as well will, will move the lever up. So let me show you how this works. Just this. Now this guard also keeps the flame from blowing out. So I'm going to put this on and now my flame is there. To, let, to make this work I need to turn that down just a little bit. So as I depress this, I this and it gives me a spot heat of where I need it. Then I'll be heating my steel, and then when I'm done with it, I, I turn the torch off. So it, it's a very important tool because you're oftentimes in smithing, like right now what I want to do is I'm going to punch the eye. And if I heat the whole thing without being able to spot heat that, then this is going to have quite large grain size. So I'll use this not only for like isolating my heat, but also for making adjustments. So it's another idea of this concept of having control of your heat, having control of your hold, and having control over your hit. So I preheated my stock in here and uh, pumped it up a little bit. Now I'm going to use the monkey hands as a handle 
for a tool. So this is something I've developed too, along with this concept of using uh, these monkey hands, is that I use the monkey hands themselves as the handle for my tool. You can, you can make a lot of tools easily if you don't have to worry about punching the eye and heat treating the entire tool. So all of these are based on whether they're just ground, heated and let air cooled, or uh, um, not even uh, heat treated. In other words, uh, like this fuller for instance, this is made out of sucker rod and I just hammer it and then let it air cool. So I don't have to worry about hardening and tempering and that kind of thing. If Traditionally, I'd be making tools just like this, and these are all tools that I've made. You know, for instance, a fuller, and uh, this is a one inch fuller, uh, one inch diameter here. And it's nice, except that you have to slit and drift the eye, you have to handle it. It all has to be heat treated, that has to be hard, this has to be tough but not soft. So it requires a lot of material and uh, a lot of time and then you have to handle it and it looks nice when you have a lot of tools but this is a little fuller and uh, this is made out of H13 and H13 is a very nice material particularly when you need to plunge it hot into steel but it's also expensive it's difficult to make soft again after you heat H13 it's let air cool it's very hard so you open up a can of worms when you have to make your, your tools um, and plus you have all of these tools with all these handles or you can have a pair of tongs that hold on to your tools and then those tools get translated into this so so I'll be using this style of tool for these tongs I could use that style of tools but I, I've come to the point in time where I just this is so much more efficient it's also efficient because when I strike with the hammer there's so little mass to overcome with the hammer. With those, you almost have to use a sledgehammer or use a heavy hand hammer. But with these, since there's very little mass to that tool, then uh, it's very easy to for, the, for the, the power that you're developing with the motion of that hammer head to go through the tool into your work. So you'll get a lot more work out of your tools than you would otherwise. Otherwise, you'd have to have a striker Another thing, it's really easy to rotate. So this would matter because it's a punch, but if I'm slitting or splitting out, I'll use this tool for instance. If I'm, I can, I can rotate this on the diamond perpendicular. I can run it lengthwise with the tool. So it's very easy to set up your tools as perpendicular to the handle, in line with the handle or diagonal one way or the other. So I've come to the point in time where I just really like this style of tool. Now what I want to do is I'm going to grind this punch. Uh, I want to sharpen it. This punch is kind of sharp, but the edges of that punch need to be sharp. And that's what's going to create the, the work for me. So sometimes it's tricky to, to grind something flat on a radius edge, but this is how I'll do it. You move it up and down. Check your work. Okay, so that's sharp. Now I'm going to sharpen the edges of that. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to use my fingers as a little D valley to, uh, so that is now a sharp punch. You'll say, well, you've got to flatten here. Yeah. I can, most of my work I'm, I'm doing with a contact wheel whether it's this three inch contact wheel or eight inch contact wheel, for a little work do I use with the platen, but yeah, that would work as well. But you can see that that sharpened that punch very nicely. So th th those edges are what's gonna do the work for you. This one's made out of H13. It's three quarter inch H13. This is forged without getting this hot. So just like these tongs, you'll, get a, you'll have a bar and you'll just get the end hot. You'll forge it out, then you'll, then with, if that is not glowing, that's not going to get hard. And you can see that if that's soft, it mushrooms. And mushroom is a good thing up to the point in time where it starts to spall. And then you want to remove the spall because though if that starts umbrelling into a mushroom, then it could chip off. 
but that is a good sign that that's mushrooming and it's also a good sign that you can see hammer marks on that if you don't see hammer marks on these tools look at your hammer face you may see hammer marks on your hammer face if you don't see hammer marks on either one of those things don't use the struck tool because they're t it's too hard and it could come off and i've had that experience before it put me in the hospital um, had a surgeon fishing around my arm trying to get a piece of shrapnel out and he he gave up he said it was too hard and then now i still have a piece of shrapnel in my arm and when i walk through a metal detector i have to declare that so so you don't have to like argue with the surgeon give me that pair of forceps i can do this uh make sure that whatever you're striking is softer than your hammer you've got to have some hierarchy of hardness we'll talk more about that when we get into uh, metallurgy but your hammer should be uh, the queen in some regards the anvil should be the king the anvil should be the hardest tool in your shop the anvil should be next hard because if you accidentally strike your anvil you don't want it leaving a mark the anvil is quite a bit more expensive than the hammer and i can grind the hammer out but then i don't want the tools to be harder than the hammer so the hierarchy of hardness is the anvil the hammer and then your struck tools the tongs shouldn't be hard they should be tough so if you strike your tongs they should bend so this gives you an idea that that's hard. This is air hardening steel. Now you could make this out of this punch out of, you could still, you could make it out of rebar. You could make it out of coil spring. You could make it out of 4140. But if you make it out of anything other than an air hardening steel, then what you need to do is keep water nearby. Take two or three hammer blows. If you take four, you're on your own. Two or three hammer blows, quench it. Two or three hammer blows, quench it. The nice thing about the H13 is it stays hard even when this is incandescent. This can be 1600 degrees. It's still harder than your steel. That's, that makes it difficult to forge. You have to forge it at about 2000 degrees. Don't forge it much hotter than 2000. It'll go hot short on you, which basically will crumble apart if you hit it. So 2000 degrees to about 1650 is your forging range on H13. You'll feel it. If you're hand forging this, this is some of the hardest steel you'll ever forge that's why it's hard at the red heat and that's why we use this material so getting back to punching the eye i'm gonna bump these up a little bit and uh a pair of my monkey hands that holds onto these tightly that'll work sometimes the, the the tools get sprung so you have to readjust the uh, the bit so that's good Now I've got good control over my tool. My tool is sharp, that's hard, that's soft. This is out of the way. It's got a nice handle. I don't have to worry about the tool working around on it. Now, the center punch, also made out of H13. Not important to make the center punch out of H13, but it is a pretty hard steel. So it's, uh, you can, this was forged with a power hammer and you can almost see that it was forged too cold because it was struggling. Now you can lay out your tongs when you punch them. If you're not confident about uh, seeing the eye, and the eye is this oval, and so really it's my, the, the hole is gonna be about right there. So what you can do is, you can center punch, and say for instance, I center punch, and I, I wanna move that center punch. So I go light it first, so there's my mark. And if I wanna move it, then I can back it up into something. Yeah, let's see, I'll, I'll put a hardy in here. And I can, I can drive it in the direction I want it to go. So that's, that's a little closer. When, when, when I, I'm, I'm confident that that's where I want my mark, then I'll confirm it with a hard hammer blow. And so that's about where we need to punch that eye. Now that still is just ballpark. That's gonna give me the location where I put my punch. Now, I don't always do that, but that's one way of laying them out. Now, you notice I, I laid that out on this side of the tong, not the inside of the tong, because I want the metal to be flat against the anvil when I punch this. I want it to, that eye to be flat. If I, if I rotate it around, then it's going to suck it in. So I want the suck end to be on the outside. 
you can imagine suck in it's just like if i push like into a loaf of bread it's gonna like drag it down it's not gonna be perfectly st straight edges it's gonna pull it down so uh so i want the suck in to be on the outside not on the inside okay well Like this, but of course, we have this little clip holds in place so that it stays on. Now, when you hold things, sometimes it's difficult because we only have two arms. We got to hold the hammer with one. We got to hold the tool with the other. So to overcome that. Try to find a point that you can balance things. And so if so I'm going to hold the reins with this part of my leg, and uh, the anvil's holding it, this is holding it, and that way I'll be able to, so say for instance, this were the, this were what I was talking about. I'm going to hold on to it just like that. I'm going to locate my punch over my center punch part, and I'm going to hit it just like this. Okay. I just preheated it in here, but I'm going to finish the heat. This needs to be cooled off a little bit. I'm going to finish the heat. Oh, this is not the one that I... So I preheated in the forge, but I'm going to pump... I'm going to, I'm going to bump the heat with the torch. Make sure you get a little bit of reserve on both sides so that it doesn't draw your heat too much. Propane heats at about 4,300 degrees. If this were acetylene, it would be heating at 5,800 degrees. The nice thing about heating with propane is a softer temperature and it doesn't have as much tendency to melt the surface but you still want to keep it moving, okay? So I'm going to put my punch here and arbitrarily I'm gonna, I'm gonna be off. So you can see where the circle is, but the center punch mark is over here. So what I'm looking for is a bullseye. So I'm gonna, what's called throw my heats away. And I'm going to make sure that that's on my mark. I'm gonna, I put my tool on, on my, Tong and I'll walk the tool wherever I need for it to go. I can't, if you've got a lot of caffeine in your system, it's going to be tricky to like find it. But if you, if you walk it, so I'm gonna walk it just a little bit more over here. So I threw my heat away and now you can see I've got a bullseye. So my first one is off. So it's like, okay, well, that's not a problem. Don't, don't pursue it make sure that you're on your mark. So then I walked my tool. It's a lot easier to walk it than to try to place it. You can see I can walk that all the way across. I can walk it up. So walk it until you get your bullseye. Now, when you heat, I'm heating here, I'm heating there, there, there. I'm not heating in the middle. The heat will conduct to the middle. If I heat the middle, then the heat will conduct to the edges and I won't get a very thorough heat. So, so if I heat from side to side and skip past the middle, you see that I've got a very consistent heat all the way through that eye that I would not get if I heated just the middle of that eye. Okay, so now I'm ready to punch this hole. So I'm going to hold it at, on my, make sure that I'm looking good. I've got my bullseye and I'm going to rotate the punch as I'm punching this. Because that punch was just sharpened by a person, not a robot. And it's not perfectly round. Now I went thunk, 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 and then now, now it made a different sound. 
it's a high pitch. That high pitch tells me that I've got a little wafer in there that can't be thinned any further. It is cold. So I'm gonna bump the heat just a little bit more. And what I'm looking for, when I punch the hole, is a shadow on the back side. And that's where the punch is supposed to feel against the anvil. And that's going to create a darkened circle. And black things were meant to see the first that darkened circle as a rose. So I'm going to be four punching it on the outside. And I'm going to listen to it because it's going to, it's going to be rotate it. You want to hear it? The pitch goes higher and that means it's time to back punch it. So that, that pitch is higher. I'm going to flip it around. And we're going to look for the rose. There's our rose. So the rose is the point that the punch made as it's pushing the steel on the back of the anvil. Now I'm, I'm keeping the bit off of the anvil and I'm going to center the punch at this heat over the rows. And now it's really important to keep that bit off of the anvil because if you don't keep that bit off of the anvil, it'll bend that eye back and forth. Now what comes out of it is your hot biscuit. So there's your hot biscuit. And that hot biscuit is at about a thousand degrees. And I used to pass that around in the class to see how dedicated the students were and they would hand it one to the other. Until at one point in time, I gave it to a student and smoke came off the hands and realized that medication isn't uh, always uh, what it's cracked up to be. So now I've got a clean hole in through really tough steel. My suck in, you can see my suck in, it's happening on the outside and the inside is nice and flat. So I'll do the same thing uh, twice with, uh, with the other tong. Preheated. This is about 800 degrees. I'll bump the heat. Now this one I did not, I did not uh, center punch because I can uh, give myself a visual by giving my uh, a light mark on the outside of the ring. And that light mark is called a witness mark. A witness mark is a mark that you'll make that imprints the process into your Steel, but it, it, it's light enough that you can still change it. So I'm going to go with the witness mark on this. It means I don't pull, need to pull it up entirely to forging temperature. This would be a good heat for my witness mark. So I'm going to look at it and it's like, that eh, looks pretty good. I could go a little bit higher and a little bit to my left. Now something to keep in mind is that your, your mind always wants to tell you that you're right on the money, but one thing to like a mirror image, you could put this up to the mirror or you can just spin it around. So I'm seeing that it looks centered here and it also looks centered like that. So once I'm convinced that that's ready to go, then I'm going to proceed. Again, I'm getting here, I'm getting here, here, here. And I need on both sides. If I don't need on one side, my, the front half will be hot enough. So now I'm going to get on the back side. I be on either side of where I'm going to work, and then heat conducts to where I want to work. I'm looking at the temperature of the work. This is about 1800 degrees. It's in orange. And then I get a little bit hotter to a brown and white orange is where I want to work this. There's my, there's my heat. Remember to rotate your punch to average out any inconsistencies in the sharpening process. By hitting the rain, it vibrates 
Now here's that high pitch. And I, that's what I'm looking for is that high pitch. I flip it over and I find my rose. So there's my rose right there. That rose is gonna give me not exact, and I'm leaving my bit off of the rain, off of the edge of the anvil so that it doesn't uh, bend it back and forth. Take a look, give yourself a witness mark. If that looks good. Back punch. Here's your hot biscuit. That hot biscuit is more like 1400 degrees, so I'm not gonna play that game. And then you can get your punch out by rotating your stock on the, on the diagonal and then tapping it. So the H13 survived very nicely, um, both holes only quenching between holes and it made a very clean uh, hole that was easy to um, back punch and, and it sheared right out. So this, this is all quite thick, still thicker than it's ultimately gonna be because now I need to drift that hole. Okay, so um, I'll begin by making a drift. And I'll find a piece of scrap. You can, you can start your forge by carrying fire to it. If the forge itself still has uh, auto ignition temperature, this takes a lot of the drama out. So now what I want to do is I want to make a drift so that I enlarge that hole. And uh, I'm going to make the drift out of 3 8 because that's the size that I'm going to make the rivet out of. So this is 3 8 and uh, the, it will be drawn down for an entrance taper. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So this is a half inch drift, but the drift is going to have an entrance taper, a refinement area, and an exit taper. The entrance taper is going to be at least four times the thickness of the stock that you're drifting. This is going to be at least twice the thickness of your stock, and that needs to be twice the thickness of your stock. Your drifts can be too long, they can be too short. Uh, if they were too short and you wanted all of those things to happen, then th there wouldn't be very much transition in that shape. If it's too long, it's going to be hard to get a hammer blow on it. So your drifts, you want them as short as they can be, but you don't want to force too much of a taper all at once. So it's going to be a gradual taper, refinement area, and then an exit. Make sure that your hardy is marked so that when it goes in, it's consistent. Uh, we're always, since we're working lengthwise on the anvil, the hardy goes in lengthwise. That, that, that's whether it's bending fork, whether it's butcher, they all go in um, so that we're, we're working, we can, we can rely on this in line with the anvil. Another thing is, I've seen this a lot too, is people don't pay attention, that that should be almost like a center line down your anvil. And this is not bad, it's almost, it's like a couple degrees off. But if you use your anvil as points of reference, and this is not parallel to the face of the anvil, then you'll, when you're cutting, you'll wind up with a spiral. So just make sure that when you're making your tools, that they also are registered so that you don't have uh, incidental errors because of a real simple thing to correct at the time when you're creating that shape. So first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna nick this. The handle is four inches wide. I'm gonna, I'm gonna transfer three inches over here. It's nice to know sometimes. I'm just gonna nick it partially through. Hardy out. Never forge with the hardy. You know, uh, that would be a, a painful mistake. So always remove your hardy before you go back into forging. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to take 
uh, I've got three inches. I'm going to take an inch and a half and I'm going to forge a taper. And it's going to be square, octagonal, round taper. So that that is just like we did at the power hammer. Now that ball will retain its heat. That needs to be square. Now we're into the octagon. Before this loses its heat, I'm going to tilt it down. I'm going to forge the extra tape. Be careful not to get into the brittle black, because if I get into the brittle black, it'll break off. There's my exit taper. Now I'm going to plenish my entrance taper so I get 16 sides. But I'm just rotating it on the edges of the octagon. Once you get 16 sides, then you can roll it. should be small enough to go into the punched hole. This is your refinement area and that's your exit taper. So basically that's what I just made. And it's nice to make it in one heat because it, it follows along that philosophy of refinement. You see how hard that was? That's mild steel. Yeah. It, it snapped off because it's hard. It's hard from the from the forging process. Okay, so I'm going to grind this down just a little bit. So I took the mushroom off, now I've got a crown. Tools need to be crowned. If they're crowned, then the force of the hammer blow goes into the top of the tool. If it's flat, unless I hit it just right, it's gonna kick the tool one way or the other and it's gonna create a facet on that tool. So all your, all your tools on top need to have a crown. Now, this, will drive through that hole and it will enlarge the hole. But I've got the shoulder. And I'm gonna preheat again inside the porch just for a minute. But I've got a shoulder from the tongs. And if I'm not careful with that shoulder, it's gonna bend that shoulder back and forth while I'm drifting it. I could drift it here using the four corners of the hardy. I can drift it here, going around, just to give myself support to avoid too much suck in. But it's gonna, this is gonna bend down as I drive that drift in. So I've created a tool. I haven't used it for this anvil, but I can use it here.
get nervous. <laughs> This is made for a one inch hardy. This hardy is about one and three sixteenths. So it won't really matter. It's, it's got a little bit of slop, but it won't really matter. Now, I want, I want something that I can quench my drip with. The drip is gonna get quite hot. down here. And I'm ready to drift. I've preheated with the floor. Then I bumped the heat. Let's see if the flame got blown out. Again, I'm going to drift it from the outside so the inside stays flat. So this tool keeps the inside Don't force it. Take another heat. Now that's going to be hot. So I'm going to find that. And oftentimes I do like two drifts so that I can keep the process going. Make sure that that goes through. Every, every time you forge it, it's gonna thin your stock. So I'm intentionally starting off my eye a little thicker than I will have it when I'm done with it because this gives me an opportunity to do all these processes with it. And every time I hit it, it's going to thin it just a little bit. Even the drift will suck it, getting sucked in in the top. And um, so that was the first drift. Now, flatten it. This one I know will go through. And drift it again, because that will shrink. See, no, well, didn't win the stuff doll that time, uh, but I have another one. So, okay, thank you. Okay, so there's the punched and drifted hole. It's in the middle of the eye. I showed you how to center punch it, how to walk this the punch, hot punch. One way or the other, witness mark, hot punching it from the front side, uh, getting your rows, back punching it through the rows to uh, reveal the hot biscuit. And then I showed you how to forge a drift, double taper, one heat, so you get really good, on mild steel, really good grain compaction and you really get a good tool, a very tough tool. So that one's drifted. thick so I'm gonna take two heats to uh, to drift it pull your hand back on your hammer oftentimes I'll hold the hammer here sometimes I'll hold it here then I'll hold it here whenever I'm hammering something vertical pull your hand back because if I accidentally slipped and honestly that's what that scar is right there 
uh, that was a big flap of skin that when I did this, I saw it right down to the bone. So uh, if you, it, you, whenever you're holding, you're hitting something vertical, pull your hand back just a little bit so that you don't, things don't bounce around and you don't want to get into a situation. I'll use oxyacetylene if I don't have propane, but you really need to keep the torch moving. And that will heat the surface faster and hotter than the propane will. The propane, propane is just gentler on the surface, so your heating equipment, if you can afford it, use propane. So I'll do this, hopefully it won't get stuck. And uh, looks like I won the prize. Now, while it's still hot, with the bit at the anvil, make sure that you flatten that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drift it one more time because it's just a good practice to drift twice. Even though that stock is pretty round, I'm gonna drift it just one more time. But this eye, at this point in time, is nearly finished. As that Now, so this, this needs to be nice and flat. If that's nice and flat, then you'll have this surface right here will make a very nice bearing. So if there's any pucker on that, any suck in, I can take some of that out in the, with an angle grinder. And speaking of angle grinder, what I wanna do is, I wanna talk a little bit about grinding your anvil because uh, even working this anvil now, realizing that the anvil's got kind of a sharp edge. So I want to show you what I do when I get a brand new anvil. By the way, so this is where we are with the tongs. We're at this stage. Okay. They're getting closer. 